It's been two months since Sony gifted the world with Morbius, the international blockbuster smash hit that was so popular and beloved that people are still talking about it even now. When is it going to end? And of course, we all know that everybody loved Morbius so much that it's now being heralded as one of the worst superhero movies ever made. And see, now I want to know how it compares to the other terrible movies in the genre. And I actually found out that it's way higher on these than it should be. So now I'm wanting to put myself through the other worst superhero movies of all time just to see if they are somehow worse, as according to Rotten Tomatoes' bottom 33 superhero movies of all time, with a little bit of cheating in there. Now, just as a reminder, Rotten Tomatoes is percent percentage score is actually just a measure of how many critics gave it a positive review rather than being like a score out of 100. But I just thought their list had a better variety than like IMDb, so that's why I'm going off of theirs. All right, so obviously I thought we should start things off with number 10, which is... That's not Morbius, that's not Morbius, that's not Morbius. Morbius! And would you believe the movie is not very good? I don't know why this is on here actually, when we all know it should have a 200% on Rotten Tomato. It is extremely difficult to talk about Morbius normally, but I almost feel like it's okay to do it now since just Jared Leto is like joined in on the meme and shot it dead in a ditch. So yes, I did see this in cinemas and yes, I do regret being born. The group of friends that I saw it with, we did not stop laughing all the way into the cinema. And then the second the movie started, it completely stopped and stayed that way for the next hour and a half. Everything about Morbius is really funny, except for the actual contents of the film, with the exception of that one scene, of course. God bless Matt Smith for being the only fucking thing in this movie that kept me awake. Like we had to make up that he says it's Mormon time because God knows Jared Leto doesn't do anything else interesting in the movie. And of course, how could we not mention that very recently Sony re-released it in cinemas and then immediately pulled it when it made like seven dollars. Not realizing of course that the only reason people were talking about it was because nobody actually wanted to fucking see it. My god Sony, please never stop being this funny. All right anyway, I'm very done with that. Number, well 16, but our number nine is Underdog, which I'm pretty sure I saw in cinemas. I'm so sorry, Mom. Underdog is based off of one of those old forgotten Saturday morning cartoons from the 60s, I'm pretty sure. But its live action movie in 2007 was part of that wave of really weird talking dog films in the late 2000s, like Cats and Dogs and Shaggy Dog with Tim Allen. Which means we get some of that weird fucking talking dog CGI. I was raised with one purpose and one purpose only. To help people. To keep them safe. Nothing was gonna stand Is that way. Jason Lee? Oh god, <laughs> not again. <laughs> Underdog is the story of a beagle who gets kidnapped by Peter Dinklage and is injected with various animal DNA that somehow gives him superpowers and lets him talk to humans. You can understand me? No matter how depressed Jason Lee sounds in this movie, I can't help but find it adorable how excited the dog is to be here. Look at his little tail wagon. Give the dog your food. Give the dog your food. Give the dog your food. There's nothing necessarily awful about Underdog. It's just kind of exactly what you would expect out of a movie with a premise like this. But I love dogs, so it made this one one of the easiest to sit through. They even do that thing in the credits, like Toy Story 2, where they animate some of the bloopers while still in character. There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. All right, I will give them that. That is very cute. When old ladies are falling, I'm not slow. Hip, 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 and away I go. For number eight, we have Howard the Duck, which is the one I'm most terrified of watching for this video because the only thing I've ever known about it for years is that it has duck titties. I wish, I wish that was a joke. I don't know anything about Howard outside of Guardians of the Galaxy or if he even counts as a superhero, but I didn't want to skip that many. As we can see, following the events of Spider-Man No Way Home, Howard was dragged from his home into the human world. And he's found by a girl named Beverly who must be blind or something. But with this movie's almost relentless lame sex jokes, I spent the first half of this absolutely praying to God that they would not get together. And you bet that's exactly what happens. Uh, I'm pretty tired. It's just that you're so incredibly soft and cuddly. Beth, let's be realistic. I mean... This movie made me so uncomfortable. The biggest issue with this one is that, of course, they decided to make Howard look hideously terrifying. At least everyone in the movie reacts appropriately. <laughs> I did surprisingly like quite a lot about it though. The effects are pretty well done for the time, and I really love the supporting cast, like Beverly, when she's not trying to violate several animal rights laws. Everything except for Howard, really. Howard, you really are the worst. 
God knows how or why this was even made, but it's a very expensive and well put together movie in terms of production. They really were just throwing millions of dollars at whatever back in the 80s. The movie even ends with them fighting a giant stop motion nightmare Cronenberg demon, which is the only natural way to end a Howard the Duck movie, really. I actually think Howard the Duck isn't that bad. I think it's just Howard himself is like the worst part of it and it kind of drags everything else around it down. This one's for you, cracker! I'm also going to skip over Batman and Robin because I've already talked about that in a separate video, but just so you know, Batman and Robin is on here. After stunning audiences worldwide with his performance in the hit film Kazam, Shaquille O'Neal was Steel in the critically acclaimed film that nobody saw and our number seven on this list. For those who don't know, because I sure didn't, Steel is actually a DC Comics character. He was one of the four replacement Superman that showed up after Superman got no scope by Doomsday. He was in Superman and Lois most recently, I think. This one does away with all of the Superman elements though, and instead starts him off as a weapons designer for the military. No. This whole thing just kind of derails for me with the suit. Johnny! It's hammer time. Because of how bulky and heavy it is, every action scene in the movie is more or less just him standing still with no attempt to dodge anything and complete blind faith that no one is going to aim for his mouth. Even the final battle with the villain ends with him getting done in by a ricochet. I wouldn't usually describe something as cheesy, but that's probably the best way I can describe how I feel about Steel. It's got a lot of like that family value stuff in there, and I did actually kind of like some of that, but everything else about it just gives me the vibes of one of those fake Christian superhero movies, like Bible Man. Where that son of a butt go? The Bad Cave? Next up is Elektra, which is actually a spin-off of the 2003 Daredevil movie that was also very well received, but not so much that it made it into this countdown. Obviously, it did well enough that it was worth everyone's while to greenlight a spin-off of one of the film's supporting characters who kind of died, but they explain in this one that she was just brought back to life by magic ninja people. <laughs> Elektra in this movie is graduated from assaulting blind men in parks and now works as an assassin, who on one assignment accidentally befriends the people she's supposed to viciously murder. When she, of course, refuses to go through with it, they send a bunch of ninjas after her who explode into fart clouds when they die. The main villains are this group of five completely ridiculous assassins that get sent after them, and one of them can even visually represent what happened to the studio's money after they greenlit this movie. The fight scenes, though, uh, range from, like, okay to borderline incomprehensible at times. This is going to be a running theme in some of the upcoming movies we watch. Okay, halfway now, and we reach the one that I am sure you were all waiting for at some point, Superman 4, The Quest for Penis. I actually only just watched the original Superman movie and Superman 2 very recently. I haven't quite gotten to 3 yet, but I hear that one's not very good either. But I was just blown away by how good it was, like how magical the flying scenes were and how charming Christopher Reeve is as Clark Kent, and how goddamn ridiculous the ending is. And guess which part Superman 4 takes after? Gene Hackman is back as Lex Luthor in this one after understandably skipping Superman 3, but is now accompanied by Lenny Luthor, his nephew, who I wish would just never speak ever. This is my nephew, Lenny. He worships me. The dude of steel. <laughs> Where are you gonna get it? The first and most obvious thing about this one is that the effects are so goddamn bad. The first movie came out in the late 70s, and so it makes sense that the flying looks a little bit silly, but like, come on. I actually do not understand how nearly 10 years later, the VFX could have progressed backwards. Everything in this movie happens because a kid writes a letter to Superman asking him to get rid of all of the nuclear weapons in the world. And after shot putting them all into the sun, unknowingly creates the goofiest villain in any superhero movie, Nuclear Man. Oh, no. And the earlier fight between him and Superman has to be one of the greatest showcases of bad visual effects since, like, Jaws 3D. <laughs> But otherwise, I actually thought this one was alright. I honestly still enjoy the Clark Kent and Lois parts of Quest for Peace because Christopher Reeve plays him so well that it's hard not to be charmed by it. But yeah, the actual Superman stuff in this is really, really bad. The whole story of why and how Superman 4 turned out to be the iconic disaster that it did is honestly just kind of sad and not really funny at all. Since it basically bankrupted the studio behind it and has obviously not been very fondly remembered by anyone involved. At the time, the rights to Superman were purchased by the Cannon Group, who were in financial trouble and needed a smash hit to save themselves from shutting down. And surely Superman was a surefire way of guaranteeing a profit, right? 
The movie had its $36 million budget slashed in half just before they started filming, which meant that a lot of these scripted action and effects scenes had to be as cheap and easy as they could manage. Like the whole famous Great Wall of China repair beam scene, for example, was originally meant to be Superman rebuilding it at super speed, which makes a lot more sense. They even cut the movie down to 90 minutes so theaters could pack in more showings of it during the day, which meant that a further amount of the scenes they did film were cut out, like an entire failed nuclear man clone who was meant to be more similar to Bizarro. The same studio also owned the movie rights to Spider-Man at the time though, so had Superman 4 not failed, we maybe would have seen a Spider-Man film that would have meant Sam Raimi's may have never even been made. So there's that at least. Stop! Don't do it! The people! 2015's Fantastic Four, which is ironically also our number four, turned out to be such a colossal disaster that I think more people know about the onset drama that happened than those who have actually seen the movie. Just as a quick recap, Fox Studios got Josh Trank, the guy who may be really good but definitely not Marvel like Chronicle on board to direct, and his approach was going to be this kind of body horror-esque take on the Fantastic Four, some of which did make it into the final movie and is just as disturbing as I'm sure he was originally intending. There's also that Doctor Doom hallway scene with the exploding heads that nearly everyone agrees is pretty cool and I'm fairly sure that was him too. But after he submitted his final version of the film, Fox got cold feet with the direction it had taken from the person that they hired and the script they approved and decided they should waste even more money on reshoots, which is why you end up with scenes like this in the movie. Which reminds me, I think that the four of us should have a name. Why would we need a name? Because we're a team now and there's four of us, so we should come up with a name for it. How about the big brain and his neurons? How about Make the big brain and her stop. neurons? How about two guys, a girl, and the thing that nobody wanted? But then on the flip side, Trank was also reportedly really shitty on set and destroyed a lot of stuff and was drunk all the time, so really it would have been a miracle if this had actually turned out good. Tonally, Fantastic Four is very serious and dark, but genuinely for the first half, I feel it kind of works. Mostly. Hey! Clobbering time. <laughs> But while the first part is more of a slower introduction to all of the characters and everything that happened before the accident, it then immediately jumps a year ahead and suddenly becomes a completely different movie and way more of a by the numbers dumb superhero thing. And it's not hard to figure out which half was the one where Fox stepped in and messed everything up. The weirdest thing is though, I actually kind of like this one despite all of that and I, I can't really explain why. Both from the genuine perspective of thinking the first half is all right, as I said, but with the rest, something about it just really fascinates me with how weird the final product is. There's just something about the way that it shifts from this really dark, creepy body horror movie and ends with them taking turns to punch Dr. Doom in the face. I would really love to see the original version of this, which is never going to happen, but the parts that Trank did do that were left intact are easily the highlights of it. Monkey. But really, this entire thing was just a hilarious lesson of what happened when you half ass a movie and only make something to retain the license for it, and I'm pretty sure no one enjoyed this movie more than Marvel Studios. Now, for some reason, Rotten Tomatoes' third one on the list is Son of the Mask, but I'm not really sure if that counts as a superhero movie. I mean, I know it's based on a comic and all, but there is absolutely no good being done here. I might save that one for another time anyway, so our number three is Catwoman, widely renowned to be one of the better entries in the DC Cinematic Universe. First of all, I want to thank Warner Brothers. <laughs> Thank you for putting me in a piece of shit god awful movie. <laughs> And this movie kind of sucks. <laughs> Boasting a bold 9% on Rotten Tomatoes, Catwoman has many, many issues. But the most obvious one is that to people with a certain condition, the editing in this movie could actually be considered a safety hazard. There's no part more infamous than the basketball scene where she and the love interest grind up against each other in front of a bunch of preschoolers. Again here, Catwoman's comic backstory is completely tossed aside in favor of a brand new and definitely better one where she gets flushed down a sewer pipe and burped on by a cat to give her magical cat powers. They went all in on the cat thing here much further than just the usual costume that I'm familiar with for Catwoman because now she can jump like a cat and has cat super strength and does this. And this. And... They also established that the Cat Women are a line of specially chosen women who have inherited these powers, including Michelle Pfeiffer's Cat Woman, whatever the hell that's supposed to imply. It's overtime. 
Dangerous level of secondhand embarrassment aside, I am genuinely impressed at the things Halle Berry was willing to do for this role. Give her a Razzie all you want, okay? But I'd like to see you do some of the dumb shit she does for this movie. Catwoman had a $100 million budget, by the way. It's very important that you are aware of this while watching these clips I'm showing you. I actually think so far, this is the only one that comes even close to being as bad as Morbius. <laughs> Okay, again, technically Supergirl is next here, but I already saw Superman 4 and this one is like two and a half hours long, so we're just gonna skip that one. <laughs> so number two is Zoom Academy for Superheroes. And with a whopping 4% on Rotten Tomatoes, I can only describe this one as the arch nemesis of Sky High. The soundtrack is almost entirely by Smash Mouth though, so how bad can it be really? Tim Allen plays retired and depressed superhero Zoom. <laughs> who has been recruited by the military to train a team of kids involving one who has super strength, telekinesis or something, invisibility, and the kid from the cat in the hat who can do this. The power of inflation fetish. I get that it's the character he's meant to be playing, but Tim Allen just comes off as really bored and uninterested throughout the entire thing. Show of hands, who here does not live with her mom in her basement? <laughs> the CGI in this is Sharkboy and Lava Girl level, which of course is the highest form of compliment I can give to anything. I don't think Zoom is as bad as the 4% would have you think, and it does have its moments. You care about us, right? I brought cake. It's just strangely a lot gloomier than I would have thought. Like Zoom's whole backstory is kind of really sad. They explain later on that his entire team was dosed with gamma radiation by the military to make them stronger, which ended up turning his brother evil, which then made him kill his entire team. And now they're going to send another team of inexperienced kids to fight him instead. Chubby will Chubby. now be called the Incredible Bulk. Ah. It's just so depressing. The whole movie is really depressing. I'm being asked to betray children for money. The entire thing builds to the epic final confrontation with Tim Allen's brother, who you don't even see until the final 15 minutes. And yeah, this final fight is kind of lame. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Zoom bombed. It made back 12 million of its $75 million budget. This had a $75 million budget, by the way. If I had seen this as a kid, I probably would have really enjoyed it. 4% is a bit much. It makes it sound like it's fucking garbage. I'm Jupiter, the gas giant. Oh, no, 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 no. And lastly, our number one is actually a bit of a curveball. Max Steel? The only one in this entire video to have a 0% rating. Which again, doesn't mean that it's ranked a 0 out of 10, but just that absolutely nobody liked it. Which seems really mean. I guess we will see. For those unaware, this is based on a Mattel toy line that became a cartoon, which itself is based on an even older cartoon, which is based on an even older toy line from the late 90s. I haven't seen a lot of Max Steel, aside from what I caught every now and then after school, but from what I remember, he's basically like Blue Beetle with a little robot that helps him turn into different forms and shit. The movie has a very different tone from the show though, from what I remember of it anyway. It's a lot slower and darker and takes itself more seriously in the same way Fantastic Four does. Ah! Well, until Steel shows up. Oh god, my mom is coming. You have to hide. Is my mom dangerous? The effects in this are actually really good, like with the Max Steel suit, for example. It's especially impressive given the movie's five to ten million dollar budget. Wikipedia doesn't really say. And again, just as a reminder, one hundred million dollars. The lore here of Max Steel is only sort of slowly revealed to us through a series of conveniently timed flashbacks that I assume was likely explained in the minute-long intro in the show. Max is a half alien who regularly begins emitting blue jizz energy that Steel, a defected member of an evil alien race called the Ultra Lynx can like eat. Oh, it's okay. Cut that out. To prove that this one really is a superhero movie though, it does end with a fight between him and a guy with an evil red Max Steel suit. Weirdly enough though, I actually kind of enjoyed this one. The smaller budget gives it a more grounded, smaller scale feel compared to the other ones with only really like steel sticking out amongst that. But overall, it was the complete opposite of what I was expecting from a score like this, let me tell you. I'd even go as far as to say this is actually my favorite one in the whole video. And of course it had to be the one with 0%.
Making me look bad over here. So yeah, bit of an anti-climax for number one, but hey, it's not my list. I feel like I'm going crazy. I expected to be able to tolerate like a few of them, but I feel like the only ones I really didn't like were fucking Morbius and Catwoman. I don't know, maybe when you've seen shit like Metal Man and Sinister Squad, even Rotten Tomatoes' bottom worst list doesn't seem so bad. So there we go. Those were the worst of the worst superhero movies, sort of. And none of them were worse than Morbius. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and special thanks to this month's top Diamond Vault patrons for continuing to fund me so I can afford to rent these movies. Adam Vershaw, Buttermaster, Matthew 11045, Jake, Enderpigman 9, and Primal. And I'm gonna go watch Spider-Verse or some shit. <laughs>